Up next, we'll get a young person's take on the upcoming Synod for Youth in Rome. Connor McLaughlin will join us, but first, more news. There are some troubling numbers for vocations in the United States, according to the latest annual survey commissioned by the U.S. Bishops Conference. The number of priests who will be ordained in 2018 has plunged by nearly 30 percent compared to 2017. Last year, 590 priests were ordained. That number is expected to be 430 this year. In a statement, the bishops did not offer a reason for the drop, but instead said there are reasons for hope and areas for growth. The vocation's chairman for the U.S. Bishops' Conference, Cardinal Joseph Tobin, did acknowledge the drop, but said that it's essential that the faithful continue to make the conscious effort to encourage young men to be open to hearing God's call and assist them in the discernment process. The men who are to be ordained this year reflect Cardinal Tobin's plea. Eighty-six percent of them were encouraged to become priests by someone in their life. My next guest is a 20-year-old college student and leader of the English language Facebook group for the Synod on Youth. It was one of 15,000 people who went online to express their opinions about the church and their experience in it. Now, those opinions were supposedly collated and brought to the pre-synod in Rome to be included in a final document. That document will be used by the bishops to make pastoral and perhaps doctrinal adaptations next October. Here to share his thoughts and concerns about the final document is Connor McLaughlin, who joins us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Connor, thanks for being with us. Now, tell me, why did you join this me. Facebook group? What was your charge? What were you supposed to do? Well, I saw an ad on Facebook that basically said, hey, do you want to get your voice out to the church? And as a young person, like, that's something that is huge. You can never get an opportunity to get your voice sent straight to the Pope. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, let's join this Facebook group. Let's jump right in. Let's answer these questions. And honestly, let's just get voices out there. And the whole idea of just having all these young people together to get their voices out inspired me so much hmm. at the beginning. <laughs> Okay, now let's get into this. I, I want to play for the audience. I'm going to put up full screens of this final document. Connor, I want your reaction and to see how all of this comported with what you and your peers were discussing online. In Section 5, the topic of church teaching is raised, and the final document suggests that perhaps some of those church teachings should be changed. It reads this way. There is often great disagreement among young people, both within the church and in the wider world, about some of her teachings, which are especially controversial today. Examples of these include contraception, abortion, homosexuality, cohabitation, marriage, and how the priesthood is perceived in different realities in the church. As a result, they may want the church to change her teaching, or at least to have access to a better explanation to more formation on these questions. Connor, is that what you and your peers believe? And what did you see on your Facebook group vis-a-vis -vis church teaching? Well, it's not that we want church teaching changed. Any faithful youth is not going to say, oh, the teaching on abortion, we want that changed. The teaching on abortion is there for a reason. And the Catholic Church has always been defender of the innocent and defender of truth. And that's why we wouldn't want it changed. But when we got there and they published the document, the number one thing that started to happen was we realized that a lot of the things that we had mentioned in the Facebook group answers just weren't there at all. And when we said, I don't think mm. there was a single person who was talking about, oh, we need to change church teaching. What really has to happen is not a change or even a better explanation, but it's the way in which we are presenting the truth. So if mm. you think the perfect example is the new Avengers movie is coming out. We don't have a problem if you at look at why is Avengers doing better. It's not because, oh, these are great heroes. The actor who plays Loki, Tom Hiddleston, he says it best, because Marvel makes their villains heroic and their heroes flawed. And mm -hmm. it's that truth that we see in those movies that makes such riveting stories. In the same way, the church needs to be presenting her truth as reality. We don't need to sugarcoat it. We don't need to hear, oh, just Jesus loves you. That's all you need. We need to hear the actual truth. Why does the church have a problem with homosexuality? Because it's against 
the natural order. Why does the church have a problem with abortion? Because it's the killing of an innocent life. We just need to hear the actual facts. And that's what all of us came to the synod proclaiming. We didn't want any change in church teaching. We merely want, if anything, the church to just be honest with us. The church is rarely honest with young people. And that's really all we're asking you to do. We don't want you to change. We don't want you to do anything, but tell it like it is, because that's the way you're going to reach us. Now, Connor, further down in the same section that we were just talking about, there's a statement that seems contradictory because it says, similar to what you just said, many young Catholics accept these teachings and find in them a source of joy. They desire the church to not only hold fast to them amid unpopularity, but to also proclaim them with greater depth of teaching. It looks like they're covering both sides and in the middle in this document. There seems to be an internal contradiction. Why do you think that is? the kind of back and forth here. We want the church teaching to change, but actually we want it to be proclaimed more, more stridently. I think what they're trying to do, and this is simply because of the nature of the synod, they're trying to make this an overwhelming document that means everyone, and by doing that, they're watering down all of the information that they could give. So they're mm. trying to say, have every youth say, yeah, you know what, I see myself in that document. I agree with that section. But in reality, I mean, you can see this anywhere. If you try to meet everyone, you're going to end up meeting no one. You know, that, you raise an interesting point, and it's been reported that much of what was discussed on the Facebook groups that you were partaking in was actually missing from the final document. One of the young people who was charged with writing the document, his name is Isaac Withers, claims in an interview, quote, there was a huge online community asking for the extraordinary form of the mass to be represented in the document. And I realized going through those comments that we as a writing team had not been shown the wealth of online commenting we were given only a summary of these comments. And so I was saddened to see that many in this group felt disheartened or not listened to. The document would have been different had the online world been represented properly." End quote. What happened here, Connor, in your opinion? So they actually just published both the summaries of all the English social media groups and the summary of all the groups that met in, mm -hmm. at, in Rome at the actual synod or the actual pre-synod meeting. But if you look at the summaries and then look at the actual comments, Isaac is completely right. There is a huge, huge amount of things missing from the summary. Some people have attributed this to some of the controversy surrounding the Francis papacy and people behind it. I think that it might, that could be a case, but I'd like to keep a little bit of a more hopefully youthful mind in the idea that maybe the papacy isn't completely corrupt or even slightly corrupt, because that's just terrifying. I like to think that it's just an issue between the young church and the old church. The young church says, we want this, and the old church says, you don't really want that. For example, like you mentioned, the extraordinary form of the mass. Mm -hmm. A lot of people disagree with the fact that youth love the extraordinary form of the mass. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've never even been to the extraordinary form of the mass. I've never been to Latin mass. I play music at my church at school that is like a mix of praise and worship and you know stuff in the hymnals. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably not the best person who would be pushing for the extraordinary form. But at the same time, I see reverence in what people talk about the extraordinary form. And if the people who are summarizing these, these Vatican officials who are summarizing these things looked at what we were actually saying, they wouldn't notice that we were simply saying, oh, we want the extraordinary form. We're saying we want reverence in the mass back. There mm. are so many, so many issues that people see with the mass that they attribute simply to the Novus Ordo, Ordo form of the mass mm. that is actually simply just irreverence. You mm -hmm. have these clown masses. You have masses where they don't use proper um, hosts. Everything about this is simply irreverence that is shown more deeply in the Novus Ordo form. That's why a lot of youth are going towards the extraordinary form because they see it as a sort of revival of that which is reverence. Mm -hmm. We don't think that, I mean, I think I can speak for all youth, all Catholic youth across the world. We don't want these 2,000 years of tradition removed. It's something that makes the Catholic Church so beautiful. Everyone knows the saying, Gregorian chants, and most people can at least appreciate mm -hmm. it and say, that's nice, even if they don't enjoy it. And because of that, if the, 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 the Jataken officials took away our comments to create this summary and were removing what we said about desiring more reverence in the mass, that's, that's removing this beautiful truth that we have. This is what makes the Catholic Church so great is that we're so rich in tradition. Mm. But if we're getting that pulled away from us, this is just an utter tragedy because mm. what, what's being left for us? 
If, if everyone has had this for thousands of years, why shouldn't we also have this beautiful thing of the Catholic Church? Now, Connor, you contend that there were other topics that were left out of the document as well. Masculinity and femininity, abortion, homosexuality, access and visibility of the clergy. Why do you think those issues were scrubbed and not directly addressed in the final document? I think these are all issues. So abortion, homosexuality, um, the clergy, masculinity and femininity are, are all big topic issues that Catholic speakers all over the world are talking about because they're something that reach the youth. But again, the older church does not, and by saying older church, I'm no way mean, I'm being offensive by this, just mm -hmm. the older members of the church don't understand what the younger church actually want, so they're not mm -hmm. going to address it. Most of the older church, most, so a lot of youth ministers and priests don't know how to talk to people my age about mm -hmm. authentic masculinity. And that's such a big issue in our church today. I mean, not just our church, in our world. We don't have authentic masculinity anymore, and that's hurting our world. But the church, the older members of the church, don't know how to talk to us about it. So they're just taking it out because they don't know what to say. In the same way, they're afraid that they're going to say something that is maybe polarizing about abortion or homosexuality mm -hmm. and lose so many members of the young church. But if the young church are actually true to the faith, they'll understand church teaching. And this goes back what I said before, Raymond. If we are proclaiming the truth in the proper way, then youth aren't going to leave. Mm. We just need to say it in the right way. And because the older church doesn't know or doesn't listen to the younger church in how to proclaim this, they're removing it from the document entirely so they don't have to address it. Do you agree with Robert Royal who made the suggestion that uh, the older members of the church that you're talking about, the cardinals and some of the bishops who were charged with uh, synthesizing this document, that they were using young people in almost a ventriloquist act. They were kind of making the young people say what they really wanted, not what the young people were calling for. I mean, it's a huge possibility, especially with the fact that so much was left out of the summary. I mean, I don't know for sure, so I'm not going to say one way or the other, but it seems very likely that that is the case, yeah. Mm. Now, Connor, I was pilloried, and this is going to be a long intro to the next question, by a very small group of people who maliciously took a question I asked my panelists weeks and weeks ago, and they distorted it. They took it out of context. They claimed that I was being callous toward young people or suggesting that the Vatican should not listen to them. Now, this is the dark side of social media that, frankly, I loathe. People can say and do all manner of things with abandon online, and their viciousness really knows no bounds. I was asking a question about the particular people invited to this pre-synod gathering in Rome. And I asked whether the bishops were listening to these particular young people who had little experience of life or God. Now, a couple of people out there in social media land decided to twist those words to suggest that I was saying no young person could experience God and that I was judging all young people. This is a sad joke. Anyone who knows me and has watched this show for years knows how I feel about young people. I've devoted the majority of my literary life writing books for them. I've personally spoken and listened to tens of thousands of students all over the country and even globally. I've launched StoryOriented, which is a literacy campaign for young people. And I started a guild to advance the cause of sainthood for Matty Stepanek, a boy whom I think was profoundly touched by God before he died at 14. So forgive me if I'm not persuaded by their silly arguments and trash talk. But to the point, Connor, uh, you were concerned about some of those invited to this pre-synodal event as well. Who were they that you were concerned about? And are they reflective of the group that you joined online? I don't think they are reflective either of the group that I was a part of or of the Catholic Church in general. If you have atheists in the church who believe that God is not real, that isn't representative of us at all. Those of us who believe not only that God is real, but that just like you, Raymond, we will devote our entire lives to serving him. I mean, I run, I do Catholic YouTube. I've done it for the past three years with my channel. And my channel's called Rise Up Jerusalem because my entire life goal, I want to focus on getting my fellow peers to rise up and follow God. And if they have people at the Synod who are supposed to be speaking for me, my listeners, any type of youth people like me, they shouldn't be people who don't believe in God or who believe in a different God or people who have fought our religion for so many years. 
If that's the case, and again, this goes back to trying to include all young people. If this is what they're trying to do, then it's not responsive of not just myself, but of all Catholic youth. Mm -hmm. I am not an atheist. I should not be represented by an atheist. I'm not a Muslim. I should not be represented by a Muslim. I should be represented by a faithful Catholic who believes the church's doctrines and wants to help the bishop understand what the youth believe in order to help us get to heaven. That's Connor, who should repeat be there. the story you told me earlier about uh, a participant who walked out of the, the pre-synodal meeting because not only were there atheists invited into this meeting, but there was also there were Muslim uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, um, I was reading an article about someone who was from Pakistan who ended up leaving the synod because they realized that some people in their group were Muslim. And in Pakistan, the Muslims were killing the Christians. I mean, imagine being that kind of a person. As an American, I really can't understand that kind of ordeal that you're sitting there and somebody says, oh yeah, I'm Muslim. How can you talk about God and how the youth should be affected and how the youth should be helped? across from someone whose family killed your family. Mm. I mean, not well, metaphorically, yeah, of not, course, I, but I'm sure yeah, back in no, generations, they fought. Yeah. Well, look, I, I mean, I can understand if the church wanted to hear from all young people, but when you are gathering a group of young people around issues of faith, doctrine, pastoral concerns, morality, the Catholic teaching, I doubt if the imams, you know, are inviting Catholics or Presbyterians in to consult with them on how to adapt uh, Islam for the next generation. It, it wouldn't happen, and, and I wouldn't blame them for not including the Presbyterians and the Catholics. Uh, the final document also mentioned uh, the role of women in the church and the desire for change there, Connor. I want your reaction to this. It says, today there's a general problem in society in that women are not given equal place. This is also true in the church. What are places where women can flourish within the church and society? The church can approach these problems with real discussion and open-mindedness to different ideas and experiences. What do you make of this? Honestly, it's a little bit scary because whenever you start talking about the role of women in the church, the first thing that comes up is a flashing neon sign that says women deacons. And we've been over this so many times. This is not a thing that's actually going to happen or that should not actually happen. W women can flourish all across the church. I mean, Mother Teresa, Mother Angelica, you can't tell me those women weren't upheld by the church. And in the simple day-to-day -day life, not going across India or starting this television station, women I see everywhere doing great work in the church. There are women who read the, the readings for mass. There are women in choir. You don't have to be masculine or feminine to put your gifts for the church. Everyone has a gift. You make it the best you can of it. It's just like Jesus said, we each have different gifts of the Holy Spirit that we are given. And that's the biggest issue. It's not a question of how should women be represented in the church. It's how can youth best use what they are given from God to serve the church. And if we're starting to get about women deacons and all that, that's just clouding the entire conversation away from the actual issue. Mm. Connor, before I let you go, given what you've seen, and you really had a front row seat on watching the evolution of this pre-synodal document, where do you think the synod in October is headed and what do you expect to hear coming out from that? When all the bishops of the world convene around this document and offer their own reflections and I suppose changes and adaptations. Honestly, this is why um, a bunch of us started a Facebook group to respond to the document. We're not rewriting the document, of course, that we don't have the ability to do that, but mm -hmm. we're going to expound upon the document because as is, the document is really, really, really not going to help the bishops. Like I said before, it is very watered down. It doesn't give any specifics. Our document is taking a lot of what we see that is missing from the actual face. We downloaded all the Facebook comments compared mm -hmm. to the summaries and said what is missing from what the, like Isaac Withers said, what is missing? Mm -hmm. And so we're taking mental health, we're taking masculinity and femininity, we're taking all of that and we're bringing it so that we can bring it to the bishops and say, look, here's actually what we believe. Fortunately, mm -hmm. hopefully, I hope, they will read that and if not, I don't know where the church is going to be with youth because we're already in a really, really precarious situation mm -hmm. and I don't want it to get any worse. We just don't deserve that as a young church. Connor, before I let you go, where can people find you on Facebook? What's the address? 
So the address for the group is if you just type in the response group for pre-sended document, that's what we are. It's really simple, that's all we're doing. We're responding to it, and mm -hmm. we're not a bunch of Americans. There's two people from Poland, there's someone from Pakistan, there's someone from China. We're a group from all over the world. Granted, mm -hmm. you, if you wanna join us and help us, please log in, answer the questions, Join us in our mission. Please mm. help us show the bishops Connor, what we really want. You know, I've been inspired by this. So here's the deal I'm going to make. And, and I'm sure my staff is going to love this. In October, I want you to come back and some other young people. I'm going to convene our own young papal posse and give you all a chance to comment on the outcome of this youth synod. Would you be up for that? Sounds fantastic. Okay, we're gonna hold you to that and we'll bring a few others along. Connor McLaughlin, thank you so much for being here. We'll check in with you in the coming months.